He is risen. risen Oh, that's good to hear. I love that. When I got up this morning, the world was engulfed in fog. And as I was driving into church, the brightness of the sun was burning through that fog. And I thought, isn't that the way it is with the time of Easter? That the world was caught in the fog of depression and despair and confusion. And the Son of God broke through out of that dark tomb and burned away all of that. And he continues to this day to burn away all of our confusion and our depression and our worries. It's just a glorious day to worship our Lord. And I am so glad that you are joining us either here in person or via the computer, which as all of you know is not one of my favorite things in the world, but it is very much bringing us together to celebrate our risen Lord. And so now, as you are able, would you please rise and join me in the call to worship? We have not seen the risen Christ. Let me see it in the lives of those transformed by grace. We have not seen Jesus face to face. We have not touched the wounds from the cross. Our scripture today comes from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. 
As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put his, my finger in the marks of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The word of our Lord. It is our pleasure today to, re to welcome Pastor Eric Chase, who is the president and CEO of Children's Aid Society of Southern Pennsylvania District. I, I uh, saw him in the hall this morning. He was commenting that he feels so at home here in Asbury that he knows this church so well. And the reason for that is because part of the Children's Aid Society is working with the Code Blue, which, as you know, we here at Asbury support and open our doors during this very cold weather to welcome people in. Eric currently is uh, leading a youth group at First Presbyterian Church in York. He's completed his Master of Divinity at Lancaster Theological Seminary and is soon to be ordained in the Presbyterian Church of the USA. So will you join with me and welcome Pastor Eric Chase to Asbury. Well, good morning, and thank you, and I'm humbled and honored to be with you. Some of you may also not recognize me because I'm wearing my summer motif. I shaved my beard off for the summertime, so you may have said, didn't he have a beard the last time we saw him? My winter motif is a beard. Uh, so, but thank you. I'm humbled and honored to be with you this morning. I got to worship with your contemporary uh, team this morning, and it was a wonderful, uplifting time. and had some fellowship, and as I said, I felt very much at home. I feel very much at home at Asbury, and uh, I thank Joe and the team of inviting us in in the midst of the pandemic, you welcomed us in to start Code Blue Emergency Shelter. And just to let you know, this season we served over 165 different individuals, 15 to 20 every single night. And believe it or not, we were open more in March and January than we were in February when we were with you all. So uh, who would ever think that March, February would be a warmer month for us? So, But let me pray with you if I can before we start our message this morning. Gracious God, we come before you this morning and we just thank you and thank you for the opportunity to hear your word read, to hear your word spoken. I ask that you direct my words to be pleasing to you, that they build your kingdom. I ask that you open our ears so that we may hear, that you open our eyes so that we may see you and your son Jesus and continue to believe, and that we open our hearts so that we know what we are called to do as we follow you and your son Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but often little children are afraid of the dark. And um, I'm an opa, I'm a grandpa to my two-year-old grandson, Henry. And we have another grandson on the way who's coming in July uh, to my youngest son. So we're going to be twice as blessed with children. But this story is about a little boy who one night his mother tells him to go out on the back porch and bring her the broom in from out back. And the little, mother turns, the little boy turns to his mother and says, Mama, I don't want to go out there. It's dark. And she explains, Jesus is out there. He'll look after you and he'll protect you. And the little boy looks at his mother again real hard and asks, Are you sure he's out there? And she says, Yes, I'm sure. 
He's everywhere, and he's always ready to help you when you need him. The little boy thinks about it for a minute and then goes to the back door. He cracks it just a little bit, and peering out in the darkness, he calls, Jesus, Jesus, if you're out there, would you please hand me that broom? <laughs> it's hard to see in the dark, isn't it, often? And the darkness sometimes comes to us and we're afraid. We often stumble or stub our foot when we can't see where we are going or where we are going, especially when you have to be like me and get up in the middle of the night to use the restroom and you stumble on something that you didn't know was there, but when you turn the light on, it's very clear it's there. So maybe we turn our flashlight on, and as a child, I remember, I would be in the dark, and I swear I would see things in the corner. And if I, my mother turned the lights on or I turned the flashlight, it disappeared. It went away. When the light was turned on, things not only appear different, but they are different, aren't they? And our reading this morning in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, I just want to lead you up a little bit. In the previous chapter, we heard about Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene, and then he appears on the road, and then he appears to the disciples here, and then he appears to Thomas, and then one more time in John, he'll appear again. So I want you to count that up. That's five appearances of Jesus. They see him five times after the resurrection. Okay. And our encounter is with the risen Christ. He has gone to the cross, and as we celebrate last week, he's ridden. But the disciples, where are they? They're again, they're in the upper room, and they're hiding in fear and doubt. They're behind locked doors in the evening, where the light of the world, no one can see them. It's not bright at all, and the darkness of night is falling upon them. They're in the dark, fearing that the Jewish people who have recently put their Lord and Savior to death, may come after them. They're locked up in that room. But Jesus enters the room through the locked doors. And John tells us, suddenly they saw, suddenly they saw Jesus standing in their midst. They saw Jesus. And then they heard him say, peace, my peace be with you. They first saw him. And then they heard him say the greeting he always said to them. The words they heard was, peace be with you. And these words now have a new meaning because Christ has made his peace. He has made his peace on the cross. He has made peace for the world through the blood of his cross. Those who are justified by their faith have peace with God, don't we? And Jesus brings the light of the world. He is the light of the world. And he brings it into our darkness and our fear. Because it's through our faith. After announcing peace to them, he then showed them the marks of his passion, didn't he? And that is what he's telling them. is peace has been obtained by what I said I would do. They saw again the prints of the nails in his hand. They saw the wound in his side from the spear. And then joy filled their hearts, we're told. And then, even though they saw him, even though they heard him, even though they saw the wounds, they saw the piercings, then they finally say and realize that it truly was the Lord. And they were joy filled. Their hearts were filled and they realized it was truly the Lord. They saw Jesus standing there. They saw the marks in his hands. They saw the wounds in his side. And most importantly, they saw that he did what he said he would do. He rose from the dead. Hallelujah. Seeing is believing, isn't it? And as the disciples are not to enjoy his peace selfishly, he then tells them that they're supposed to share with others. Now, let me just paint the picture here. They're locked in a room. They're afraid. They're doubting. Jesus comes through the doors that are locked, which makes him divine because if he was human, he wouldn't be able to do that, right? He then says to them, see me, peace, wounds, wound. And then he says to them, now you need to go out in the community and share this peace with everybody just as I did. What do you think the disciples are doing? They're getting ready to pack their bags and run. Because they saw what the world did to Jesus when he shared his peace with the world. 
But he sends his disciples, doesn't he? He sends them into the world, just as the Father sent him. He lets us shine a light. He lets us shine a light on this, that which he causes his disciples to do. Let me shine a little more on this light. If you remember, when we talk about Jesus and Christmas time, he came as a poor infant babe in a stable. He was a poor person. Then we hear stories about how he came to serve, how he served. And he was a servant to others. And he came to serve and not be served. He emptied himself, didn't he? And he delighted in the Father's will. And he identified himself with all of humanity. He went about doing good in the world. He did everything by the power of the Holy Spirit, didn't he? He, he cast out demons. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. But his ultimate goal, his ultimate goal was the cross. And now he says to the disciples, I also send you. I don't know about you, but this list is not an easy box. It's not like the Christian's bucket list to salvation, is it? And we go down, okay, I was a servant. And I would say that the disciples probably are still filled with doubt and fear about what the Lord was asking them to do. Have you ever had the Lord ask you to do something and you're kind of going, really, God, me? You heard earlier that I'm now working in youth ministry again at First Presbyterian Church. At age 50, I kind of declared I was too old for youth ministry. And God came back and called me several times again and again. And in my world, when God speaks to me, it's never been one of those times where he says, Eric, this is God. I don't get a text message. He doesn't email me. He talks to me through other people. And when my pastor asked me if I would help out with the youth group, I said, well, I'll help plan. I'll do things. But I, I don't, what's this old guy going to do with young kids? I don't think I connect with them anymore. Then somebody else came up and said, well, if you do the youth group, I'll help you with the youth group. If you do it, because we had so much fun when we did youth group together, too. And then my wife, who's a member of the session, the trustees, the elders, the ruling board of our church, says, you're going to do the youth group thing? I'm like, okay, God, I got it. I got it. But one of the things we do, I really enjoy in working with youth is mission work. And one time we went on a mission trip to Georgia. And we were taking care of this woman's house. She was an older woman who served the church and was called to serve the church. And she used to minister to the people in Atlanta, Georgia, in the city of Atlanta. And when we walked up to her house, this woman had difficulty speaking. And so we had to all cluster in really close to her to hear what she had to say. Part of her face was missing because while she was ministering in Atlanta, she was caught in cross gunfire and had her jaw broken and shot off and had to have it repaired. She was a well-known cook in her church and was written up. She showed me her news articles of how she was written up in the Atlanta papers for some of her great recipes. Well, we were building steps on the back of her house. We went into the back of her house. And as we were building them, there was this horrendous smell where we were building them. And I looked up and I realized that her washing machine was draining out the side of her door. And there was a sewer pipe open there that ran down the outside of the building and tied into her main sewer drain that was almost parallel to the ground. I asked her, why is your washer draining out into the ground? And she said, well, because my sewer pipe is clogged. And it's because whoever installed it, installed it flat and not at an angle. Have you ever tried to run water through a flat pipe? It doesn't roll. So we raised it up, we reattached her washer, her washer began to work. She said, I don't know how to repay you. I wish I could make something for you, but I have no hot water in my sink. She had a basin in her sink that she would boil water and put it in. She had water to her home, but her faucet broke, the hot faucet broke many, many, many years ago and never had the money to replace the faucet. So I told the kid in charge of our, the college age kid in charge of our mission group, I said, go buy this faucet our church will pay for it. Don't worry about it. You know, I got the him and ha. It's not in the budget. It's not in the plan. You know, go pay. We'll pay for it. And I'm under the sink and I'm beginning to remove the old faucet and a cockroach falls in my mouth. And the only thought I had was only for Jesus. <laughs> only for Jesus. Sometimes God calls us 
to the strangest places, to plunge sewer pipes, to build steps, to swallow a cockroach because you're giving somebody hot water. But then Jesus also does another thing for his disciples, doesn't he? He breathes on them. And the lady that we fixed this house for, I just want to go back a minute. I forgot this because this is an important thing. She said to me when we were all done on the day and she prepared some lemonade from us from the lemon tree in her backyard, and she was just so happy to have running water in her kitchen again. She said to, I said, how do you carry on in light of all the hardship that she had in her life? And she said this to me, where Jesus guides, God will provide. And where Jesus leads, God will feed. She said, if you believe, if you believe. And here are these disciples, these doubting disciples. And what does Jesus do? He gives them the gift. He, he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I know you're all sitting there and you're saying, it's the second Sunday of Easter. Pentecost is a couple weeks away. What do you mean, he said, receive the Holy Spirit? And scholars have debated, and it's difficult, it's difficult for us to understand because we believe and we know that the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, right? Yet how could the Lord speak these words in John so far ahead of when the Holy Spirit comes? Some people say they think it's a promise of what was to come. And maybe he was preparing his disciples to receive the Holy Spirit as a ministry to see the truth that Jesus was standing before them That the risen Savior, the light of the world, had come again so that they, in seeing him, they would believe. Then he does something else that's been debated over this century. He gives them the promise and authority given in connection with preaching the gospel. Announcing on what terms sin would be forgiven. And if these terms are not accepted, sin would be retained. The disciples were then given to the right to declare through the Gospels that sins are forgiven through God's unending grace. They were given the right to declare that God forgave sin. To illustrate this a little further, the disciples go out preaching the Gospel, just as I'm preaching the Gospel here today. And some people see their way of their sin, and they repent, and they believe, and they receive the Lord Jesus in their heart. The disciples are not are authorized to tell those people, and you and I as disciples are authorized to tell those people that it's because and when they believe, it's God's unending grace that forgives them. But if you refuse, if you refuse to see your sin, if you refuse to see Jesus and believe and repent, then you were supposed to tell them that they're still in sin. It's interesting, though, in the second part of this passage, as we move into it, we hear that familiar story, don't we? We, we even sing songs about Thomas. And what do we all call him? Doubting. We even use it as a term, don't we, in our world? You're such a doubting Thomas. He has become so well known for doubting. And I think it's interesting that over the ages, we have focused on Thomas's doubt and Thomas's fear. But I have to bring to your attention, what about the doubt and fear of the other 11? They had to see Jesus. They had to hear Jesus. They had to see the wounds in his hand. They had to see the wound in his side. And then they said, their hearts filled with joy. Let's cut Thomas a break. He sees Jesus and he says, my Lord and my God. He sees him and says, my Lord and my God. But the other 11, they're hiding in their room. They're behind locked doors. And it takes them five different things to see the risen Christ. And then what does Jesus say? He says, peace be with you. He says that to calm their fears. And this was a familiar greeting from them, from the Lord. And then he shows them his hands and his scythe. And then they see him. They then go out and they tell Thomas, don't they? They say, we have seen the Lord. And they did. They saw the Lord. But I don't think we should jump to the conclusion 
that Thomas didn't get that opportunity to see the Lord. So he should be blamed for not being present in some way. We are not sure, John doesn't tell us, why he was absent from that early gathering. And I don't think it's an un... I don't think it's a request that Thomas is making. And I don't think that it's really unfair that he's asking to have the same experience of seeing the risen Lord the way the other 11 had. He wants that tangible proof, doesn't he? He wants to see and hear the Lord in the flesh. And how many of us in the world today have this same attitude? If we can see it, if we can touch it, if we can taste it, if we can feel it, we just don't believe it, though. Jesus comes again and appears to Thomas and the other disciples again and again. And he greets them with those familiar words. Peace be with you. He's not only giving Thomas the same opportunity he gave the others to believe, but again shows all the disciples. He shows all of them again, his hands and his side. And he invites Thomas in, do not disbelieve, but believe. And you heard as Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Thomas was convinced when he saw Jesus and he heard him say, Peace be with you. We're never told whether he really did put his hands into the Lord's side or whether he really did put his hand into the Lord's wounds in his hand. But he saw Jesus and he knew he was risen. He also knew that he was both Lord and God. And we should also notice that if Jesus was not divine, He would not have been able to accept that worship from Thomas. Thomas says, you are my Lord and you are my God. And if he was only a human, he'd have to refuse it. The author Max Lucado in his book, You Are Never Alone, Trust in the Miracle of God's Presence and Power. He tells a story of Bill Irwin. And I don't know if you know Bill Irwin. It's probably not a name that's familiar to you unless you've read Max's book. But Bill was not the first person to ever hike the Appalachian Trail. I've hiked parts of the Appalachian Trail, but I have not hiked it in its entirety. He has not been the only individual that began in Springer Mountain, Georgia, included and concluded in Mount Katahdin in Maine. Other adventurous souls have hiked the 2,100 miles. They endured the snow, the heat, the rain. They slept on the ground. They forded the streams and they shivered in the cold. Bill Irwin was not the first to accomplish this feat, but he was the first in this respect. He was blind when he did it. He was 50 years old when in 1990, he set out on the hike. A recovering alcoholic and a recommitted Christian, he memorized 2 Corinthians 5, 7, and he made it his mantra as he hiked. We walk by faith and not by sight. And that's exactly what Bill did. He did not use maps or GPS or a compass. It was just Irwin, his German shepherd, the rugged train of the mountainside, and his God. He estimated that he fell about 5,000 times, which translates into an average of 20 times a day for the eight weeks he hiked. He battled hypothermia, cracked ribs, skinned his knees and hands more times than he could count. But he made it. He made it the long walk by faith and not by sight. Once Jesus' disciples see and believe, he then leaves them with these very familiar words. Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Our greatest source And belief in Jesus Christ is the word of God in the gospel, isn't it? If God says it, we honor him by believing it. We are to believe simply because he said it. I don't know about you, but God doesn't lie. God doesn't make good mistakes. And when God speaks, we need to listen. This is our good news. 
I think it's interesting that John concludes this chapter. And when you're looking at the Gospel of John, we're at chapter 20, and there's chapter 21, and Gospels, John's Gospel is ending. But the story of the church is just beginning. And he leaves us with this admonishment and these words that say, I wonder, he says this, he says, John concludes by explaining that the purpose and objective of writing this book, that the reason he put this down in writing, it was so his readers, you and I, may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. I wonder what it's going to take for us to see, to believe. I wonder where we need to shine our light in the darkness of the world so that others may see and believe. I wonder when we are being the light of the world, taking that darkness of this world and shining the light of Christ on it. I don't know about you, I'm a pastor and I work in a Christian organization. And my opening line is not, hi, I'm Eric. I'm a Christian, let's talk about the gospel. But I look for those opportunities where in the world, I can have the conversation about my Lord and Savior and help others to see so they may believe. Whether that's praying out at a restaurant and those around us stop, and pray with us. Whether it's having a conversation with someone and saying, hey, I go to such and such church. Do you want to come and join us? Whether it's your son is in high school, we have this youth group. They really might have a great time. Come, come play, come be with us and learn a little bit about Jesus. And then sometimes God opens the door in an amazing way. And I get to tell a story about Jesus to someone in a very public place and someone comes over to me and says, hey, are you one of those Christians? And I say, no, I am. I wonder, what does it take for us to believe? What do we have to see to really believe? The peace of our Lord be with you.
may be seated. We have a number of concerns listed in the bulletin. Uh, Buzz Brosey is still responding to his treatments, but is recovering. Mary Jones is still recovering from her hip replacement surgery. Bob McElwain is still recovering from his knee replacement surgery. Marshall Warner is once more back at Kingston Court after taking some tests at York Hospital. The neighbor, Tony, of Mike and Sue Debbin is recovering from the stroke and heart attack and uh, as a result of, a, of an infection, and they are asking prayers for him that the antibiotics will do the job so that Tony will not have to receive surgery. Uh, is there word on that, Mike? Or? Okay, thank you. Uh, he is doing better, and uh, there's still a question of whether or not he will need surgery, so we want to keep him in our prayers. Dave Meaner it was recently discharged from the ICU for heart issues, and unfortunately, Mary Miller, the mother of Lon Miller, fell this weekend, and she is now in room 322 at UPMC. She broke a wrist and an arm and a pelvic bone, and so uh, they are, it needs a prayer for healing for Mary. And uh, Lon is definitely in need of prayers for guidance as to where this is going to be leading him and his family in the future. So please keep them in your prayers. Joy's yesterday we had the um, breakfast, the community breakfast, and we served over 90 people at that breakfast yesterday. And so we praise God for the ability to reach out to the neighborhood and to provide, hopefully serving their souls as well as their bodies as we reach out with the love of Jesus Christ in that. And one of my great joys is that the chicken barbecues are returning in May. Love it. So uh, look for those. Make sure you order your chicken barbecues. And it's a great way of not having to cook. So uh, I think that's all the joys and concerns and announcements that I have. So we are going to join our hearts together in prayer. And I would just like to add, my wife, Ellen, had a total replacement knee surgery about three weeks ago. She's recovering famously. She has a 107% bend on the knee. And Tuesday, we go back to Allentown where she had the surgery because that's where our health network is. I won't get into all of that. But, um, and uh, she should be cleared to return to work. So prayers just that everything goes well with her post-op and that she's excited to get back to work. If you didn't, anybody who knows my wife, you can't keep a good woman down. On Palm Sunday, I came home and she was mopping the kitchen floor with her cane. So just so you know, so I need prayer too with that whole situation. So let's go to, let's go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Risen Christ, our eternal Savior, like the disciples, we are gathered together the week after Easter, wondering whether it's true and marveling at the possibility and daring to hope. Like the disciples, we are sometimes afraid and sometimes full of doubt. But your extravagant generosity, your boundless love, you appear to us in our fear and love us in our doubts and grant us the oceans of your peace. Thank you for loving us as we are and who we are. Teach us not to hide from doubt, but to recognize it as a door to the mystery and to the deeper faith. After all, the disciples' fear became a visitation as they saw you among them risen and triumphant. Thomas doubted, but his doubt became a moment of revelation as he saw you, as he heard you, and he believed. This morning, we pray for the many men and women in our society, in our world, who have no faith at all, who have not seen, who do not believe. And there are so many who live without hope, without knowledge of your resurrection, without your light shining in their lives. Grant us the courage to live as witnesses to your resurrection, to the risen Christ, and to be the light in our world. We pray for those in this congregation this morning who may find it difficult to believe. Lord knows that they are not alone. They're in the best of company. Even Christ's own disciples struggled to believe all that they had seen and heard. Loving Christ, it is in your presence that removes all fears and erases all doubts. So come and grant the doubting Thomases in our midst your presence and peace. 
And grant to all of us, living Lord Christ, renewed faith, great courage, and your boundless peace. We rejoice this morning for a community breakfast that not only served souls, but also served bodies, that nourished those that maybe were hungry for a meal. And loving God, we pray for all those that were mentioned in need of your healing powers, in need of the doctors and nurses to come alongside them. And we know that you are the great healer. You showed us time and time in miracles how you were to heal those that were most in need, whether it was healing their souls or healing their physical bodies. And now, God, we come before you and we pray that prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the and power, power and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Part of seeing and part of believing is reacting to our Lord. And our reactions take the form of many actions, shall we say. One of which is to be generous in supporting the missions that he is giving us from his heart. And so let us rejoice with the generosity that you have shown this morning. Thank you for these gifts that we now return to you. May the ministries they will support help people to see and believe in the risen Christ. Amen.
Now go from this place. Go from this place seeing and believing. And go from this place to testify to the resurrection of Christ, to give assurance of forgiveness of sins. May Christ Jesus breathe his spirit and peace into you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all until we meet again. Thank you.